Let's get started. So today we're going to be talking about differences and differences, difference and differences, whatever the your preferred term is for this. So, <clears throat> you know, we're basically delving into what I'm calling these kind of canonical research designs. Um, and we're starting with difference and difference. It's a little bit um, unusual, but it's, it's so such a kind of a workhorse model and it's going to open up a huge number um, of questions that I think it's a good place to start. Um, where I want to start with this is, is talking about how we initially talked about research design. So this was something we talked about when in the first couple of weeks, remember I, I sort of posed you this idea of what's a research design. There's this question of, you know, in experimental research, this idea of the credibility revolution. Well, I kind of gave this definition of a research design. There was some kind of statistical or economic statement of how we were going to estimate a relationship between two variables that was causal. And this design would hopefully have a description of how some variance in X is either approximated or caused by a randomized experiment. So the reason I wanna bring that up is I wanna highlight, so Donardo and Lee have this really nice handbook chapter from the um, Handbook of Labor Economics called Program Evaluation and Research Design. Where they kind of make this distinction between two types of research design. Um, sorry, this is just text from it, where they say um, they really distinguish between two types of statistical conditions. They, they talk about the D condition, um, where D here stands for data-based or design-driven or descriptive. And those are conditions thought of descriptions of what actually generated the data rather than assumptions. So an understanding of the data generating process. Um, and then the idea is that in contrast, when important features of the data, data generating process are unknown, we have to invoke some conjectures about behavior, perhaps motivated by an economic model or other aspects of the environment. We don't know if the conditions will hold, but we need to make them to make inferences. We'll label them S conditions for structural, subjective, or speculative, which I, I thought was a, a nice. And so their point is that kind of inference about program effects will frequently involve combinations of these conditions. You kind of need to know both. One thing that they kind of argue is that the nice thing about these S conditions is that there are testable implications um, at times. And I want to highlight this because this is what we're going to, we're really going to be getting into today is a little bit of um, difference and differences is kind of thinking a lot about something that's putting a lot of structural um, assumptions in order to be able to um, do estimation. So, you know, the deconditioned designs clearly fall into the PGP description of a research design. Knowledge of the data generating process leads to variation in the data generating our identification, right? So their idea is that, you know, you know some element of the process that creates, um, you know, random variation. You know, for example, when people show up, that if they show up right after one o'clock versus right before one o'clock that there's gonna be very like stark differences in how they're treated and you're exploiting that variation in some meaningful way. That's really the deconditioned design. And S conditions fall less into this context. And it's really, you have this idea that you wanna articulate, but you don't know how to think about approximating as a random experiment. And this is gonna become clear as we talk about difference and differences. So what do we wanna do? So this is, you know, I, we're going to talk a lot about difference and differences, but here is kind of, if you want to give the full-throated best explanation of why you want to study, um, do difference and differences, and like in many applications, you want to estimate the effect of a policy across groups. But unfortunately, the policy assignment just isn't uncorrelated with group characteristics. I mean, this is very common, right? Is that there are some groups who get targeted and others who don't, and there are good reasons that one group is targeted versus another, or one group gets, tar um, there's a focus on one versus the other. And the question is, is how do you identify the effect of the policy without being confounded by these level differences? And so, you know, this difference in differences is the, is the approach, is that this is kind of the workhorse for thinking about this. And so that's what we're gonna do today. So the, what I wanna, I'm, I'm sorry that this seems like I'm, I'm bouncing back and forth, but this, was, this is a really hard set of slides to kind of put together. And in part, 
this was because this literature has had a certain amount of upheaval over the past five to six years. So the tension for me is to kind of provide context for how people currently and historically have studied difference and differences. So you can read and understand these papers, but I also want to elaborate on the concerns identified in kind of these very recent working papers. Like a number of the papers that I'm talking to you about are still in working paper form or they're only just getting published right now. So this is really kind of a field that has experienced a lot of um, changes recently. And the key issues that we're gonna, that are they're gonna kind of boil down to are first, you know, what is the counterfactual estimate? Does the estimator that you're gonna regret, that you're gonna kind of use, like the regression you run or the means, the difference in means you take, does that map to the estimate that you want? What is that estimate? What are you, are you getting at what you meant to? And then second is what are your structural assumptions and their implications? So do you need to assume an exper a functional form to get at what you're getting at? Like, is it really an experimental analog or is it that you need to run the data in a very particular way to kind of back out the, um, the, the um, estimate that you're interested in? Most of the papers that we're gonna talk about point out issues in these sort of the difference and differences um, problem, but they also provide to solutions to almost all of them. So what I really want to go into this with is the understanding that, you know, you can be very aware that there's actually kind of been a real upheaval and change in our understanding about how to do these types of approaches when doing um, estimation, but with the knowledge that that doesn't shouldn't keep you from doing work in this setting. Um, you may just have to be kind of more careful or provide um, additional robustness analyses to kind of verify the assumptions that you're making. Any questions so far? I know there was a lot of, there was like a lot of throat clearing to get to slope, slide five, but hopefully we're all on the same page. Okay. So let's just start with the basic setup. So. You know, let's assume we're just going to, we're in a panel setting. So what we have is we have N units indexed by I with T time periods indexed by T. We have some binary policy D and we're interested in its effect on some outcomes YIT. And the inherent problem is that D isn't necessarily randomly assigned. You know, this was the same problem we ran into when we were thinking about um, just traditional cross-sectional estimation, right? The historical and parametric assumption underlying um, the potential outcomes model that we're, we're interested in, or one version of this, that we that we basically, almost all cases that we make, is this idea that, look, the potential outcome for our outcome, so for, you know, given DIT, so DIT is our, our treatment status, we have some outcome YIT, that it is a linear additive function of some, you know, Per, per person specific effect, so alpha i, some level effect, some time effect, and then some you know heterogeneous effect. So we're allowing people to have heterogeneous effects as a consequence of this treatment. And we could make this more complicated, right? So right now I'm assuming that there's just like a band, like no time invariant effect. If you get it, you're treated immediately. Um, this could be made more complicated. But the idea, right, is that such that we can define kind of really tightly what is the counterfactual that we're interested in. And it's yit1 minus yit0 is equal to tau i. And so the implication here, right, is that in the absence of the treatment, the units, the yit units within i evolve, or excuse me, across i evolve in parallel. Their gamma t's are identical. So absent the policy, the units might have different level effects, but the changes would evolve in parallel. And this is a parametric identifying assumption, but it obviously makes these very clear um, differences, right? So for the untreated group, you get this gamma T minus gamma T minus K within, within person, if they're untreated and across people, you get the difference in the level effects. So let's focus on the, like the, the, the two, two by two difference in difference setting. Since D isn't randomly assigned, well, so, sorry. So first, remember what we're typically interested in is we want something like the average treatment effect. So the average treatment effect, right, is the difference in the, in the groups 
So that would be the expectation of the tau i, that's the average across all individuals. Um, or we can know the average treatment effect on the treated, right? So this is, we kind of talked a little bit about the difference here. These are equal to one another when you have perfect random assignment. Here, what we're saying is this is the treatment effect for the people who take up the treatment. So it's, we kind of are getting the average effect, but it's conditional on just the, the sample of people who are, who are taking it up. So the average treatment effect on the treated is just going to, so this should be a conditioning statement here, but it's going to be, it's the expectation of their average effect conditional on being treated. And since D isn't randomly assigned and we only observe one time period, this model isn't inherently identified without additional assumptions, right? So the problem is, is exactly like in the beginning of class, it was um, of the semester is that you know, the treatment effect could be correlated with the level differences. And we need to be able to estimate kind of a counterfactual to deal with this fact. The people kind of in one group versus the other, we need some unbiased way of being able to estimate both the treated and untreated group. Where can we get an unbiased estimate? And so with two time periods, we can start to get in that direction. Two time periods plus this um, parallel trends assumption. So this is what's called the two by two um, difference in difference. And so here, if we think about our simple model with the added linear additive separability is that, well, when the period is zero, we have two periods and, um, and treated and untreated. Well, in the base period, what we have is the base period untreated, we'd have gamma zero plus alpha I in the, and then in the post period, you would have just the time varying effect. And then similarly, you in the other periods are going to add in the constant effect. And then you can think about, all right, well, what's the within unit difference? Can I just compare within myself? And so the trick is here is that you can take the difference between, within a person. Um, and what you get is you get the, the change as a consequence of the time effect. And you get the change as a consequence of whether or not they were treated in that time period. So when I look within a person, that's what I get, right? I get these, these differences across the two. So, you know, if everyone were treated, I wouldn't be able to distinguish between the aggregate time effect, right? The gamma one and gamma zero versus the treatment effect within a time period. So this is another way of saying, right? That the aggregate effect is not disentangled from the treatment effect without there being variation in the treatment across individuals. Um, because we're allowing this time effect to be changing over time. If gamma one was equal to gamma zero, right? If things are just flat over time, then we could identify this even just within person. We would just take, take this as our treatment effect. Um, so what you can do, right, is you can say, all right, well, the difference in outcomes conditional on the treated for those who have the treatment turn on for them, minus um, the difference in outcomes for those who don't have the treatment change, well, that's going to be exactly equal to the effect that I'm interested in. It's the treatment for those who have the treatment turn on. And so I was kind of, you know, when I write this, I'm, I'm, I'm more punchy than I probably need to be. But in the sense that there's a lot of notation here and kind of the notation that I had to keep around was this aspect of, I'm talking about what the change in the treatment is. I haven't specified any kind of mechanism about how the treatment happens. And one thing that can happen, for example, and this is worth keeping in mind, a lot of times this is just buried in the back, is think about there being some treatment status for people. So it's one versus zero, and here's time. A huge amount of the time when we're, can you guys see that? Okay, can you sort of see it? Yeah, good enough, okay. So a lot of times when we talk about difference and difference, implicitly what almost everyone has in mind is what's called absorbing adoption. So it's what we're gonna talk about a lot, but what they have in mind is that everybody is kind of untreated and then someone gets treated and they stay that way, right? So there's like an untreated and then something changes in the world and they're treated. And so then we're thinking about there's a treated and an, an untreated group, but you know, that isn't always the way of things, right? So as you write down different types of estimators, 
you might get something where there's some people who go this way and then there's some people who are treated and they become untreated. So in both. Or, um, you know, another version is it could be within the same person, it goes like this or vice versa, right? Depending on how many time periods. So there's, what this is gonna do is that there's gonna be a set of, if I just have a binary treatment, notice then that without additional assumptions, the change in DI could be, have basically three values. Oops. Right, because it could be that I go from being treated to being untreated. I could stay the same, either I stay treated and just maintain that way, or I stay untreated and I stay that way, or I could be untreated and I become treated. And you know, that's gonna that's going to potentially have some imp strong implications of what you're assuming modeling wise. So, what I want to highlight first is. Much of the time, we're going to ignore the possibility for this to happen. So we'll just focus on zero, one. There are papers that differentiate there, but you have to then think about, do you want to be symmetric in your, um, in your effects, right? Do I think that, that I get the same effect of treating, going from being untreated to treated? Does that have the same but negative effect of going from being untreated, of being treated to untreated? Anyway, this is just something worth highlighting. If we do the simplifying assumption where we say absorbing adoption, it becomes very easy where we just talk about, well, you're all untreated in the base period and now you're treated. And so we're comparing a treated and untreated group in the two by two and we get exactly the average treatment effect on the treated. Um, this change where the policy can turn on and off and can vary, this becomes an issue with heterogeneous treatment effects. Peter Hull has this working paper thinking about mover designs where he talks about it a little bit. I'm really not gonna touch on it more than just wanting to highlight it here. It does come up. Um, and one of the papers that we talk about later is gonna allow for this switching back and forth, but it's just worth highlighting that, you know, it's a, you have to think carefully about what is the, the causal estimate that you have in mind in this setting this was a pretty well-defined idea, but once you start talking about um, it being able to switch back and forth, that becomes a lot more challenging to think about what the, um, the model is because if we think about the potential outcomes, really what we're saying is that there has to be, if there's two time periods, it's a question of, am I gonna let it be a function of what my historical treatment status was, right? So if my historical treatment status has an effect on me, then the possibility of like going from being treated to untreated or vice versa can have impacts on the, on the way that I estimate things. Anyway, I just wanna highlight this because this is always typically very buried in what's going on. Um, but that's, that's the rest, for today, we're gonna ignore that issue for the rest of um, what we talk about. Okay, so, Basically, from what I told you, um, you know, if you take this, because I, I sort of, we highlighted that this difference in difference here, so we have this difference in one versus the other, that that's going to get you exactly the average treatment on the treated. Um, simple linear regression is going to get you exactly that. So if you put in location fixed effects or unit fixed effects and um, time period fixed effects, that's going to take you, give you the two differences. This is gonna get you the average within a group. Um, this is gonna do the first difference on, on the unit and this is gonna do the time difference. And you'll get exactly this, the coefficient on beta here will get you um, your estimate estimate of the average treated, um, the ATT, the average um, treatment effect on the treated. This approach, is sometimes referred to as the two-way um, fixed effects estimator, so TWFE. Um, that's basically just in a regression format is a simple way of doing the, this double differencing. You could have done it directly, right? So the reason we do it in regression a lot of times is we want the standard errors, but we could have directly estimated tau by just saying, okay, just like with the inverse propensity score weighting, um, well, we need a counterfactual for the treated group and we needed the counterfactual um, for the control group, we're going to use these deltas to get at it. 
and that we're taking that different. So we're going to be generating a counterfactual by using the changes in the untreated group. Any questions so far? Hopefully this is relatively familiar. Okay. So, you know, that's just with two, two units, with two, or excuse me, with two time periods. With two time periods, you know, you can, you can get this, if you're willing to assume this model is there, you can estimate this effect. Um, multiple time periods can really help in a number of ways. And so to start, let's start with um, the simple version of having multiple time periods, which is that the policy that we're interested in all occurs at a single time period. So we're not staggered, but we have a, um, a time period that hits and we're going to be, it's going to hit for some and not for others. So there's going to be treatment and control um, groups. It's gonna, so everyone is going to be not treated and then the, the thing will happen and they will be um, treated and untreated. Basically more time periods is going to help you in two ways. So if you have multiple time periods before the policy implementation, we can partially test the underlying assumptions. So these are sometimes referred to as pre-trends. If we have multiple time periods after the policy implementation, we can examine the timing of the effect. So we can say, okay, what's, is it an immediate effect? Does it die off? Is it persistent, et cetera? And what you can do is you can say, okay, well, I can look at the dynamics and I can also kind of pool everything into one host variable that's interested in estimating the average effect. And so the, you know, one thing to be careful of is if the sample is not balanced, that could have unintended effects. And the typical way that one would implement this is by running a regression that looks like this. So this is just looks like a two-way fixed effect estimator, except now what we've done is we've created a base period. So here I've indicated that T0, like T0 is my base period. And I'm gonna be looking at all time periods before and after where I'm gonna interact, with, uh, I'm gonna get a different time coefficient on um, the treatment indicator uh, on this. So actually, so this should just be DI because you know it's a time invariant characteristic on whether or not you're gonna be treated. So you're gonna be treated, you can estimate a different effect in every time period um, and it's all gonna be relative to some base time period T0. Let me pause here, does this, does this make sense to people? This is sort of how you would, estimate kind of a dynamic panel regression, you would want it with a single time period, you're gonna have within fixed effects for the unit, and then you're gonna have time fixed effects to capture kind of aggregate time differences. And this will be capturing the relative difference between the two groups. So, okay, cool. It sounds like at least you're sort of familiar with this idea, um, you know, and having seen this, um, What's interesting about this is that, you know, for the for this model, we made a stronger assumption about trends, right? So th this is substantially more parametric um, than anything we've done previously, right? I have I in a lot of cases we were kind of being pretty flexible in what the model looked like, um, and I'll talk about exactly what that means, like an explicit way in which this is this is so parametric but we're being we're making a strong assumption but then strong assumptions have at least some the stronger they are the more falsifiable they are is in some ways you know that's not always true but in the, some cases that's true in this setting there are some things that are quite falsifiable as a consequence and so one of the big ones is this idea of um testing pre-trends so pre-testing um for, for pre-trends. This is a really is really powerful and has helped spark the growth in difference and difference regression. For me, certainly it's something, you know, it's visually very compelling to kind of understand um, and showing the validity of the design. And so um, there's kind of two recent issues that have been raised. I would say, I think the authors of the papers who work on this would say that this is fair, that some of this like sort of maybe sat in the background of how people thought about these, but it was never really formalized. And there's kind of been some recent papers that have formalized this pretty clearly. So um, uh, pre-trends is kind of testing these pre-trends is something that's gonna be um, really useful, but I'm gonna show you kind of two issues. And just, I'll, I'm gonna say this twice, but just so that you know what I mean by pre-trends, what I'm saying is that 
these delta T, remember if the T are before, so we were talking about here, that what you're trying to do is show that the difference between these two effects in the pre-period that these should be equal to zero, that the idea is that the, you know, that the aggregate trend and then the level difference between the two groups, that that captures all the difference between the two of them. That's sort of an implication of our model in order to identify the average treatment effect on the treated. Like if that, you know, that, that's an implication of asserting the, this model. We've asserted this, and so as a consequence, we, that has to be true. So then, of course, if you find evidence that it's not true, you're like, okay, well, I'm not identified anymore. <laughs> um, so let's talk about, you know, what problems this can cause. And so this is from um, Jonathan Roth has um, many papers. His name will come up several times over the course of today. Um, and he has one, uh, this paper in particular is thinking about um, the problem of pre-testing, uh, pre-trend pre -trend testing. So, which is a, a type of problem called pre-testing. So consider the following issue. So you have three time periods and think about what the pre-trend test is trying to do. So here on the right, I've just showing the conditional means for the control and treated groups. This is like the raw data. So, and I just made these up. Um, so here's time. Here's the outcome on the y-axis control group. They're both this kind of a similar trend going downwards. The control group then flattens out and the treated group bounces up. I'm assuming they're treated after time zero. So, you know, the idea is when you pretest is that you're testing whether or not the difference relative to time zero for time equals minus one is significant. So, you know, what it's doing, if you think about this all here, I've done the relative difference between the two. So I've done the difference across units that that basically the, the question is, is that at time zero, is that difference equal to the difference at time one? So parallel trends would look pretty good in this setting. I mean, I made this example, it looks really good. And then you see this big effect that what we'd get is the estimate rel is relative to the effect at time zero. At time one, we'd get the estimate by comparing the two of these and it would be um, 0.75. Yeah? Unconditionally, that's like a super reasonable thing. That's like, makes a lot of sense. We should do that. It, it's like, we have a modeling assumption. We want to test it. This will lend credibility to us. The problem is, and, you know, econometricians are really good at this, is that this is basically a form of what's called pretesting, and that pretesting can kind of screw up the properties of the statistical tests that we subsequently want to do. So this has come up a little bit in class. People have asked about like multiple testing problems, for example. And the, the issue is, is that inference in the way that we think about um, statistical tests for the coefficients that we're interested in, um, those are all kind of presupposed that we're kind of doing it for the first time that we haven't been doing kind of digging around in that Sometimes what can happen is if you do some tests, that is going to screw up the, the kind of the validity of the subsequent tests that you do. And so what Roth basically highlights is that by, because we have, we're kind of not very good at detecting pretrends, we have low power at rejecting or identifying pretrends, that that can cause issues. And the way that it will do it is that, so take this example, this is the same one, but now I've made it so there's maybe a difference in pretrends, like this one has a slightly flatter one. And so if we take the difference, you were like, okay, well, there's kind of a significant difference between the two, but is it statistically significant? One could easily see someone running a paper that looks like that. And you say, well, I've got this difference here, but I don't reject it. And this one is highly significant, so I'm good. And basically what Roth shows is that what this is doing by selecting on pretrends that pass, what you're gonna do is that you're gonna choose realizations that satisfy the pretrends but induce bias in your effect. And so the reason for this is actually it's kind of a regression to the mean winner's curse kind of problem. Because the idea is that what you're going to do is you're going to pick specifications or draws where you tended to have relatively flat outcomes. So it's going to, in this context, it's going to pull down the t equals zero average which is gonna make it subsequently that you've selected on a T equals zero that's relatively low, 
And then the draws on the subsequent one will be the same, but because this one was relatively low, the change will be bigger than you would have seen otherwise. And so by kind of selecting on, and so you can go in both directions in which way the pretrend is, but effectively the idea is that selecting on this induces bias in your estimated effect um, in a way that is potentially problematic. So this is like a real, you know, you're kind of like, oh man, like this is not the kind of thing you want to invite. You don't want to invite this person to a party. I mean, I'm joking, but it's kind of like, that's a real bummer, right? In the sense that this is seems really valuable, but now you have this concern about, well, what's valid and what's not. And so my take on this is the following. So first is like, don't panic. There's an element of this, and we're going to talk about this when we talk about IV, in that you know, the real problem in this is that pre-testing here does contaminate your design potentially. You're, con con you're conditioning on this aspect, and it's basically contaminating the way that you construct your counterfactual. But really, the, the thing I kind of want to highlight is that, and I'll, I'll describe one solution that they propose, is that a big reason why this happens is it's very challenging to reject. We don't have a lot of power in our pre-trend tests. And so one way that you can kind of be very alert to this is that, you know, if you have very tight confidence interval intervals and you're relatively confident in your pre-trends and kind of the your parallel trends assumption, this is a very reasonable thing to plot and to kind of highlight and show this thing. If you have tight confidence intervals. But what typically happens is that in a lot of our analyses, the bands are really wide in the pretrends. And so as a consequence, a lot of researchers will say, oh, well, I don't reject the null hypothesis of um, parallel pretrends, but really like you couldn't have rejected anything. And like, so as a consequence, you may be selecting in weird ways by kind of conditioning on those types of outcomes. Um, Roth basically points, so this was his job market paper. He, he points to his job market paper, which is this paper with um, Rabachan, um, which basically is pro gives a way to kind of present results that are robust to this issue. You don't really pre-trend test, but you, um, you provide ways of um, showing robustness. Yeah, of course. We're totally screwed on time. Maybe I'll just do two days of it. I don't know. Let's see how far we get. I'm not going to hold you guys over. Okay. So I made this point, don't panic. I really don't want you to take away from this, like, oh God, I can't do diff and diff. Like this is totally reasonable, this concern. So this concern, um, we're gonna talk about this when we do weak IV as well. This is exactly the concern that comes up with weak IV pretesting. So for those of you who don't know this, you do instrumental variables and you instrument in the first stage, people check things like their first stage F statistic. That's a pretest. And there are serious bias concerns in the same way about diagnostically checking that. That creates exactly the same types of bias. And this is why econometricians advocate for using these things that are robust to weak instruments. Um, it, so in the same way that, that you know, that's a, obviously a thing that people should worry about. People continue to do the weak F step test, test. Like there is value in presenting these things and checking them, um, but these tools, so there is this tool from um, Rabachan and, and Roth that is potentially worth thinking about. I haven't implemented it myself, but um, is worth at least looking at. So they have basically an, a way to think about robustness in this setting. And so they say the following, which is like, look at the coefficients that we get in the post and in the pre's. This post effect is really the effect that we want, which is the average treatment effect on the treated, plus the post period differential trend. So it's the idea of, you know, whether or not, like what I needed was pre-trends. I needed that these were identical for both groups, the diff and diff between the two. If they're both untreated, they should have evolved in parallel, but that's potentially non-zero. If this was zero, I'm good. Same thing in the pre-period is that I'm assuming these are zero. These are different objects, but the kind of the implication of our assumption was that those two uh, things are, are zero. They may not be. What, uh, Ramachan and Roth basically suggest is that you say, okay, well, maybe we can use information from our pre-trend, so that's this delta minus one, to kind of bound the post-trend by using a smoothness assumption. So the idea is saying like, look, this th stuff is kind of, we have a pre-trend, you know, maybe you don't test it, it's significantly different, but you can kind of see it there. And maybe we want to put a bound on kind of what that looks like. Like we think that this potentially some way is going up, 
let's put a bound on how big that bias is going to potentially be. And the way that I bound it is by saying like, well, how much can it change? So bound the second derivative, right? That kind of makes sense. It's like, you can't jump infinitely. There's only so fast that it can change. Um, and so the idea is that here's the linear trend version. Well, what if I kind of put a bound of M, which is kind of just thinking the second derivative, can I use that to kind of talk about how much that's going to move around my effects? And the, you know, this adds a lot more work, but it potentially also allows you to account for any potential pretrend that you see in the data. They also, the reason if you look at this paper, it has a lot of technical detail in it. And the reason for it is that you also need to kind of do confidence intervals over this. And that becomes very challenging over these types of things. But they kind of have code available to do this sort of thing and it's potentially a way to um, assess whether how robust your results are to these kind of pretrends. I want to sort of highlight this is like very new, but it's potentially a way to kind of add to your results and sort of make sure that they're robust to these potential issues. Okay, that was kind of problem one about pretrends. So there's this idea of okay, we're going to test parallel trends, and there was this problem about all right, that's pretesting. Question two is parallel trends in what? So um, a known issue that historically was not super formalized, but was really kind of apparent and obvious as soon as you ran some of these regressions was, well, parallel trends in logs or in levels, right? That's kind of the obvious way of saying it. But, you know, if you think about something that's trending over time and you think about that model that we looked at, right? So we were allowed to have time varying effects and unit varying effects. Well, if we're gonna assert that model with logs, then that model parallel trends doesn't hold in levels necessarily. Right? And vice versa, if you do it in levels, it's not like it's necessarily gonna hold in logs. Like this point being that this is really like, this is what's called invariant. So we talked about this with quantile treatment effects, right? So when we want to talk about like the treatment effect on the log of wages, that's different than the treatment effect of the log of the, the log of the treatment effect on wages. And in quantile effects, that wasn't a problem because there's this property of quantile treatment effects called invariance. But OLS doesn't have that. Um, this is some people, so I was getting into arguments last night with my econometrician friends, view this as an extremely damning feature um, of difference and difference, namely in this fact that like, if you're doing difference and difference, you kind of have to have a view on the functional form. You have to have a view on what the outcome variable is. You can't just say it's logs, but if you want, I'll do it in levels unless you are willing to make some additional assumptions. So Roth and Santa Ana have this paper, um, very recent paper, um, where they're really saying this issue. And they're saying, look, if you want to do the average treatment effect, you need to justify one of the following. You either need to say the treatment is as if randomly assigned. If that's the case, you don't have to do difference in difference. That's right. Like as if randomly assigned means I just was randomly assigning. Two, the why the chosen or functional form is correct at the exclusion of others. That's basically saying, if you pick logs, you got to like logs versus levels. Or three, you need a way of thinking about the whole counterfactual distribution of the untreated potential outcomes. So another way of saying this is that you need to model the whole distribution to think about the parallel trends assumption in that distribution. So it's, you know, you can't just model the one outcome moving in parallel, you need to sort of model the whole thing. Um, and they kind of go into some details there. Um, I think that paper is very much a work in progress. So I don't think it, I think there is a very clear point that has been known for a long time, which is this point of, look, if I do it, in, I have had, had this in my own work. If I do difference and difference in levels, a lot of times it doesn't work, but it works well in logs. And well, what are reasons for this? Well, maybe the underlying data generating process is this multiplicative feature. You can think about debt or income as potentially being having this multiplicative feature. And so then logs is gonna be much more likely to be um, moving parallel. So, you know, that's kind of an annoying aspect of difference in difference in the sense that that's a strong parametric assumption. And I spent all this time talking about how we wanted to do the credibility revolution, but now I'm, you're gonna to have to make this strong assumption. We're gonna come back to this at the end, but you know, the reason why we do difference in difference is like there's a lot of policy settings in which this is the only way to study these types of questions. And so, you know, there's, there's good reasons to do this, but um, it's not gonna be perfect every time. Um, 
So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go through four examples that are kind of going to highlight the ways to do this. I think these are particularly nice examples of papers that have done versions of this. I mean, Cardin Krug is a little out of date, and but it's it's sort of canonical, so we, we need to do it. But these are all kind of papers that have done really kind of, if you want to go and look at, you know, I have X type of setting, let me look at what that, they do. These are good good examples to look at. Um, the first is Cardin Kruger. So we talked about this a little bit. Cardin Kruger is a, um, a minimum wage, studying the minimum uh, rollout of minimum wage in New Jersey, uh, where they increase the minimum wage from $4.25 to $5.05. Um, on April 1st, 1992. And the question, the obvious question was, well, what impact did that have on employment? You know, historically, there was this, there's this, uh, you know, obvious thought in a neoclassical sense that an increase, a um, forced increase in wages should decrease in employment because the cost is going up for them. And to ask the, the effect that this has on employment, we need a counterfactual for New Jersey. So we use Pennsylvania as a control. And so what Cardin Kruger did is they collected data from 410 fast food restaurants they basically called places and asked for the employment and starting wage data from 410 um, fast food joints on the border of um, New Jersey and, and uh, Pennsylvania. And they sampled data in February 1992 and November 1992. So they had a before and after. So the treatment is obviously an indicator for being in New Jersey versus being in Pennsylvania. The time base is 1992 and then you have the treated group um, in uh, November. And so there was an obvious effect on wages, right? So here's, here's the distribution on the left. And then we had wages move up to the minimum wage on the right. It's kind of an awesome graph. You see this big change here. It would be nice if the y-axis was the same in both, but what can you do? Um, so the wages go, you know, wages go up in New Jersey. And the question is, is, you know, what is the impact on employment? And what's interesting is, you know, despite this large increase in wages, there was basically no negative impact on employment. In fact, if anything, there was a, a marginal positive impact. Um, you can just look at the raw data. Most of the positive impacts, this is the main, this is the main initial table is you're just doing the raw differences. New Jersey, the full-time full employment beforehand, New Jersey went from 20.44 afterwards to 21.03, and in Pennsylvania, it went down over this period. So, you know, this is the first difference, and then we do the difference across. So, you know, the difference between the two of these, 2.76, would be our average treatment effect on the treated that we would get. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this positive impact, most of it is driven by the decline in Pennsylvania. You know, you might think that's weird, but Honestly, if you think Pennsylvania is a good counterfactual, it's not totally crazy because 1992 is in the middle of a recession or basically kind of the, the end of a recession. You can also do some interesting second comparisons here where they, they looked at stores that had, um, where their starting wage in the pre-period was above the treatment cutoff. And so that's those stores kind of performed similarly to Pennsylvania. So this is all kind of evidence that you know, this kind of sparked a revolution in in this type of research, thinking about the impact of minimum wage on, on short-term employment. Um, you know, but the big takeaway was that there was, certainly was no negative impact. Um, you know, there's some considerations here to think about, right? So the treatment can't really be thought of as randomly assigned. So the treatment is completely correlated within states. As a result, any within state correlation of errors is correlated with treatment status. So going back to our, the way that we were thinking about correlation in the design-based setting, there's not really any way to think about clustering on state. There's only two states. Um, my view on this is certainly from reading on this is given the limited number of states, time periods, and treatments, it's a lot more useful to kind of think of this as a case study. You can use some really strong parametric assumptions to assert causality, like if we make the strong parametric assumptions that like what we did at the beginning where we're like, look, employment follows this model, then we can sort of say that this is the causal parameter, but it's, it's relatively strong. There's less ability to kind of suss out any um, inference issues. It's really hard to know if any of this is driven by um, error. And David Carr kind of is easily acknowledges this, this is from a an interview with, um, with Cardin Kruger, with Ben Zipper about um, kind of their broad agenda. So the great advantage of a quasi experiment or a natural experiment like minimum wage, so it's a real intervention. It's real firms that are all affected. You get the GE effect. It's important for understanding the overall story. The disadvantage is someone might say, well, it's not truly random. The number of units might be small. You only have two states. At some abstract level, it's only two degrees of freedom. And so that's a problem. 
So, you know, this is pretty well known. This is an issue. There's been a lot of follow-up things that have been trying to exploit having many, many states that change their minimum wage. Um, and that's kind of a different discussion to be had, but kind of the key point here is this is a two period thing. This kind of two treated groups. Um, it's going to have its own issues. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to move to having um, basically uh, a set of larger set of time periods. So Danny, Ye this is Danny Yagan's job market paper where he tests the impact of the 2003 dividend tax cut and the effect on the question of whether or not that stimulated corporate investment and increased labor earnings. So in corporate finance and public finance, there's a big question on whether or not um, there was really any real effects of doing a dividend tax cut. Um, basically, the problem is, is that corporate outcomes are really cyclical. And so it's challenging um, to separate tax effects from business cycle effects. Um, the paper uses this distinction between C Corp and S Corps to um, estimate the effect. Basically, S Corps didn't have dividend taxation. And so the law changed in 2003. One group was affected and the other group wasn't. And so the identifying assumption from the paper was that um, it's not random assignment of the status, but rather that C and S Corporation outcomes would have trended similarly in the absence of the tax cut. So in a couple of these, I'm going to kind of quote out exactly what they say as their identifying assumption, because this is the sort of thing, if you write a difference in difference paper, you need to say, you need to like stipulate, here's what my identifying assumption is. In the absence of blah, they would have evolved in parallel. So, you know, the outcomes, what, are they, what does he find? Finds basically, you know, no impact on investment. Uh, S-Corps and, and C-Corps looked relatively similar across this, or they evolved in, in relatively in parallel. Um, same thing uh, for employee compensation, there was kind of no impact here, but payouts to shareholders went up a lot. So S-Corps didn't really move up nearly as much as C-Corps. These kind of, there's this big increase right at the law change and it continued to go up and, and stay persistently large over this period. Um, so, you know, kind of the takeaway from this was that tax reform had zero impact on differential investment and, and compensation, but had big impact on payouts. So, you know, there was this orthodoxy on cost of capital, the elasticity of investment, and how you'd change dividends and it would increase investment. And, you know, the takeaway from this was, well, it doesn't really seem to have much of an impact at all. It just goes to the people who own stock. Um, what was the challenge to identification? You know, you have to assume and try to prove that the only differential impact to S and C corps was through the dividend tax changes. During 2003, could there have been other shocks? Yes, accelerated depreciation, which is another tax thing, if you don't know it, um, affected them differentially, but there was kind of a difference in the law, but Yagen basically showed that they had um, similar effects in both groups. And so they wasn't through that channel potentially. A key point from this that I'll come back to very briefly, but from the economics of this is that you need to make more assumptions to assume that the zero differential effect on investment meant zero aggregate effect. So I kind of said that this, there was a zero investment case here, but remember what we're saying is that there's a treatment and then we're comparing the difference between the two, but maybe you could tell a world in which this dividend payment in some way affected and there was kind of an aggregate bump that happened in 2003 as a consequence. So that it made sort of both groups invest more than they would have otherwise. Like there are spillovers between the groups, for example, stimulating aggregate demand. All the difference in difference really gets you is it gets you that there's zero differential effect. It doesn't necessarily mean that there's a zero aggregate effect. It doesn't identify the constant. All right. Um, Berger, Turner, and Zwick, they study the impact of a temporary... Uh, fiscal stimulus. So they were looking at the first time homebuyers tax credit on housing markets. So policy was differentially targeted towards first time homebuyers where the, they defined basically, they need, they didn't know, obviously it's going to first time home, uh, home buyers, but you know, who are those people? The way that they defined exposure to this program was to say, who are the number of potential first time home buyers in a zip code proxied by the share of people in that zip in the year 2000 who were first time home buyers. So the key threat to this design is the possibility that time varying place specific shocks are correlated with our exposure measure. The idea is really just that, you know, there's basically some feature of locations where first time home buyers tend to buy. And the trick is that this measure isn't binary, right? We're, 
we're comparing this continuous measure, which is low share versus high share, but we have a dose um, response framework in mind. As you increase the share, the effect size should grow. So, you know, one thing you can do is you can just bin it. You can bin high and low together. This is kind of the rollout of the, the different policies. Here's the, this is the claims and the tax credit across the zip codes. Um, you can see it kind of peaks and then the, the program rolled out um, by 2010, uh, June of 2010. The high exposure zips had a lot more than low exposure zips. You can do that binned or you can do kind of a linear exposure measure where here they have these coefficients. Um, these are the coefficients on them um, where the right axis is capturing the sales impact. And the idea was that, um, you know, what this did was that this had a, this places that were more exposed to this had a larger increase in sales in these areas with the claim that, and sort of the big takeaway from this paper was that you had a stimulus bill that increased the amount of sales, but it didn't necessarily decrease sales in the future. If you would have thought that those areas had more sales happening, that maybe you'd be pulling them from the future. And so then you would have seen negative impacts later on. Here, what they're finding is that there's this bump and then really no subsequent impact afterwards. Um, you know, in our initial specification, remember that we didn't really specify that DIT had to be binary. So we were talking about a continuous one. But remember that if it's continuous, we're making really an additional strong functional form um, about the effect of DIT on our outcome, namely that it's linear. So, you know, we should keep this, we, we make this linear approximation all the time when we do regression, but it's worth keeping in mind. Uh, and it's, it's kind of testable in this setting, right? Because we can bin our continuous measure into quartiles and estimate the effect across those groups. And the question is, you know, what do these orderings look like? Is it at least monotonic? This is kind of a nice thing that you can plot graphically. And this is, you know, this is uh, their way of trying to, they were trying to innovate in the um, non-parametric space where this was the same idea, the time dimension on the, on the x-axis, but now what they're doing is they're ordering by the quantile of exposure. They have one percentile bins, and then the color is how steep the graph was. So it's like a heat map. And so the idea being, you should have seen in the time periods when there was an effect, you see the largest positive effect at the top of the graph and the smallest at the bottom, and it should kind of go with the timing of it. So this is another kind of nice way of, of showing this point that you should see this different, um, this monotonicity there. Okay, so I think the biggest takeaway, I, the reason I want you to see this paper is, you know, when you have a continuous measure, it can be intuitive and useful to present bin means of the high and the low group but it's really useful to use the regression coefficients of the effects that exploits the full range of the, of the measure so that you don't, people don't think you're data mining. Um, and it's important to see if there are non-monotonicities in your policy exposure measure. And in this paper, you know, there was really only one shock, right? It was the policy time period. There wasn't um, multiple time periods. And so in this last example, what I wanna show you is this paper from Bailey and Goodman and Bacon, where what they were studying was the rollout of community health centers and the impact that it had on mortality. So this is a, a nice paper in the AER where the idea was that there were these community health centers where they were basically a way of providing preventative care um, to, to individuals in the community. Um, and with the, uh, with the understanding that this is really preventative care. This is not like, you're not, these are not hospitals or ER things that are helping you say with trauma. They're trying to do preventative care to prevent things that are gonna potentially lead to mortality later. And so as a consequence would have substantially um, largest impacts amongst the elderly. So what are they doing? They're exploiting the timing of the implementation of the rollout of CHCs across areas. They use variation when and where CHC programs were established to quantify their effects on mortality rates the finding from two empirical tests support a key assumption of this approach that the timing of the establishment rollout is uncorrelated with other determinants of changes in mortality. The issue is, is that, oh, there should have, sorry, that sentence didn't get finished. The issue is that CHCs tend to be done in places where there's capacity for them, so where there are doctors. And so as a result, you know, they're, they tend to be in more dense urban rural areas. And so they, or, or sorry, seems to be more done in more dense urban areas. And so what they need to do is kind of control carefully in this way for these types of issues. Um, but 
that's kind of, they're going to kind of do the comparison within these types of things. But what they're going to be exploiting is the fact that, well, since the CHCs are started in different places in different time periods, you can use the the, the different groups as controls um, for one another. You exploit the kind of staggered rollout and estimate the effects in event time uh, relative to the initial rollout. So this is, you know, kind of their main graph here is what they're doing is that they're looking at the years since CHC establishment and the effect on overall mortality in these areas. Um, and what they find is that these are the years before operation. They kind of, they're, they're claiming that they see kind of this absence of any really pre-trend here. They certainly don't see a large, you know, it's not just the decline going, it's relatively flat. And then they see this really large decline um, where, you know, the red line is all CHCs pulled together. And then the, the blue line is, early CHCs um, fund basically put in place between 1965 and 1974, up to 12 years after the fact. Kind of a really nice test that they show is that this is the mortality rates um, amongst different, different groups. Really what they find is that, so most of these is no real significant effect, you know, infants, children, adults. So you might imagine, so as I mentioned, remember these, uh, these groups are kind of not benefiting as much from preventative care, whereas amongst older adults, 50 years plus, we see this really large negative decline um, in mortality as a consequence of the CHCs rolling out. You know, what's really nice about the policy changes being staggered is that we're less worried about the effect being driven by one confounding macro shock. So um, as a very quick story, when I was in the job market, my job market paper used a single staggered, um, a single event diff and diff. Um, this is six years ago. And I literally had um, someone in one of my interviews tell me that they didn't believe my paper because it could have been confounded by any number of things that happened in that time period. And that's you know, not a totally unreasonable thing to worry about, right? If the change happens in one time period, and so I was studying the Great Recession, you're like, okay, well, there are a lot of other things going on at that same time. How do you know that it's not correlated with something else that's going on there? Um, it's a lot easier to defend a story that has effects across different timings because you can kind of exploit the fact that it's happening in different places and, and not have to worry about those things. You still need the same identifying assumptions, which is that there are parallel trends in the absence of these, um, these policy changes. And now we're gonna kind of like, this is kind of getting to the, the end discussion here. So a big issue emerges when we exploit differential timing. This is kind of like, this is where the shit has hit the fan, excuse my language, over the past five years, is that with differential timing and heterogeneity and treatment effects, there's a lot more complications because what we've been doing is we've been extrapolating from this kind of simple pre-post treatment control setting to much broader applications where we have multiple time periods of treatment, heterogeneity, different times in which people think happens. And in some applications, the policy eventually hits everyone. There is never a, a true control group. We're just exploiting people who take it on later versus earlier. And if we run the two-way fixed effects model, the one that we talked about, this one, you know, what comparisons are we doing once we have lots of timings? This is kind of an example where I've kind of been hammering you guys about, well, what's the estimate? What's the estimator? And in this case, people sort of said, okay, here's my estimator. It's going to get me what I thought I had before. But really, there wasn't a discussion about what this was estimating per se. And so really the kind of first thing to do is, well, what's our estimate? So once we have these staggered timings, well, what are we doing? You know, how do I think about an estimate in that setting? There's a host of papers that touch on this question. Callaway and Santa Ana have this nice paper in Journal of Econometrics, which really kind of, I think, kind of clarifies exactly what the estimate is. And it's kind of the building block, at least for how you should think about what you're interested in, in most settings. They say, look, in a given time period, for a given group, where the group here means like, when did you get treated? When does your treatment turn on? I can talk about the average treatment effect on the treated for that group. So that's, I can talk about tau ATT for group G and period T as the potential outcome difference for people on average for all of those people who turn on treated. So that's like an effect I'd love to know the effect of. That's like a baseline effect. And in the two by two case, that's exactly what we wanted, right? In two by two, that was, that was it with this, these map one to one because there was only one treated group. 
and there was only one real time period that they could be treated in, right? Or that could be identified at least. Um, the the Calloway and Santa Ana paper focused on the absorbing treatment thing. Um, De Chis Martin and Diotfoy talk about it without that absorbing thing. I'm gonna focus on the Calloway and Santa Ana, but you can look at the other one if you, if you have this other setting. It seems very reasonable for the overall estimate that we want to report. We want to report some weighted combination of these tau ATTs. I mean, you guys should holler if you feel differently, but it seems, I think a reasonable thing that you want to say is, look, I want some weighted combination of these things. If I wanted to report a single number, that's a pretty reasonable thing to report. And Calloway and Santa Ana basically say that there's two ways to identify the above estimate. Um, before. You can either have parallel trends of the treatment group G with a group that is never treated. So in the right in the one time period effect, that's pretty straightforward. It's the ones who never got treated. Or you can have parallel trends of the treatment group with the group of the not yet treated. So you need some kind of parallel trends. And then you are identified. I mean, it's the same thing as what you have before, but they do basically all of this without needing to kind of lean on the linear model version. You can just think about, remember, we talked about this in the setting of, we're just generating counterfactuals. You can use inverse propensity weighting to kind of exactly get at this. And they provide a number of very natural ways to potentially aggregate all these pieces up, these tau ATTs. So that's great. So that's really nice. Well, what's the problem? Well, what happened to two-way fixed effects? Like we were in two-way fixed effects world and what happened? And so the problem is, is that the logic of two-way fixed effect doesn't naturally extend to differential timings. And so this is just sort of the problem is you have heterogeneous effects, which is what we want. And we've been allowing for a lot of that in what's going on. Um, well, what happens with differential timings is that remember the reason why we like linear regression is that regression was doing this kind of like variance weighted approximation, right? So you may remember when we were talking about semi-parametrics is that the estimate you get from a regression is kind of this, it's the underlying conditional average treatment effects weighted by the variance of the treatment for a given group. And it turns out in the panel setting with staggered timings, these weights aren't necessarily positive. So here they have to be positive because they're just variances. But when you have a panel setting, that isn't necessarily the case. And what you get is that with staggered timings and heterogeneous treatment effects, um, you can have basically a large negative weight that's put in on certain groups estimate and large positive weights on others, which puts a really, which is problematic for interpretability, right? I mean, that kind of means that this beta that you get, the beta 2AFE, doesn't really mean anything. I mean, there's no interpretability per se. Um, a bunch of these papers talk about it. So, uh, you know, Fabiola was talking about this Boris Stock and Jaravel paper. They kind of talk about this in the context of an event study. The Chez Martin and Dotfoy talk about it. There's this Goodman Bacon and Son and Abraham paper as well. All I really, I, I'm, we're going to keep walking through this, but this is totally solvable. Like, don't, of all the issues, this is like a great issue to have because you this is so like easy to fix. It's just a consequence of being casual with the way that we estimated things and not thinking about, well, what is the actual estimate that we're getting out from our estimator? Um, let me just kind of highlight kind of the idea of why this is, I think to give you the intuition of what's going on. Hopefully it's kind of already clear from the way I've been pushing it, but Goodman Bacon does this really nice example where he kind of shows where these weight negative weights can come from. And what he says is, all right, let's consider two staggered treatments and a never treated group. So this is from his paper. You have differences. So you, um, you have the triangles, that's one treated group, the early treatment. Then you have the circles, which are the late treatment. And then you have the, the um, gray line, which is the never treated. And the question is, well, what does the two-way fixed effects estimator estimate? Well, well, if you think about it, there's four potential comparisons that can be made, right? The early versus the untreated, the late versus the untreated, the early versus the late and the late versus the early, right? And it turns out that the two-way fixed effect estimator is the weighted average of all of these two by two comparisons. You can kind of decompose it into these pieces. And what these weights will do is put more weight on units that are treated in the middle of the sample because they have the highest variance. So if you remember um, back to this, that variance in the treatment is actually really valuable in regression. regression 
and OLS loves things that have high variance because they, it gives you movement in the treatment indicator. So it's going to put more weight on these things that have, a, have high variance. Well, the problem is that this weighting is actually um, not, so the weighting thing is actually not problematic if the treatment effects are instantaneous and time invariant, like this picture I just showed you, then the weights are going to all be positive. There's no time invariant thing. And you can see that, right, the comparisons, you're still going to always be kind of capturing average differences in a, in a correct way. Well, time varying effects create really bad counterfactual groups, right? So when things are time varying, now if you start doing that same exercise, right? So if instead of being discrete jumps immediately, what you have is things that are slowly changing over time, what you get is that you start comparing things that if you compare things to the early treated, to the, um, to the later treated, that what you'll do is that you're gonna get um, a contaminated effect, basically. You're gonna be picking up people who are treated and are kind of on the way to being treated and so what you're going to be capturing is the difference of their time varying effect and the new treatment effect. Whereas what you want is you want a clean control group. Ideally, in this setting, right, is what you would do is you would just compare the, un the, the treated group to the untreated in both of them. And that would give you kind of a clean version of this. Um, but what it's doing in this two-way fix effect is kind of doing this weird weighted combination. And it can put kind of this negative of um, these strong negative weights on what's going on. Um, and this is particularly problematic because this two-way fix effect estimator puts all the weight on the things that change in the middle, which means that they have lots of opportunity to have time varying effects that are kind of contaminating things um, subsequently. Um, so this Goodman-Bacon paper kind of has a way to assess these weights in a two-way fix effects design. But I mean, to be frank, I don't think there's any real reason to use the baseline two-way fix effect estimator in staggered timings. So, you know, this is a perfect example where the estimator doesn't give an estimate that you care about. And so you should just not be using it. You should be using, there are all of these graduate, former graduate students who put together papers to give you estimators that you should use instead. Um, several of them have code up that you can use. Um, they're all robust to this issue. I find the Callaway and Santa Ana one kind of intuitive because it's just sort of defined as this combination, but you know, your circumstances may vary. I think the one thing that you should keep in mind is that if your treatment is not absorbing, the um, Callaway and Santa Anne one doesn't, is not quite as intuitive in that setting. And so um, the Deches, Martin, and Dautefeuille one might make more sense. I think the idea is that we're generating a counterfactual and need to be careful that our estimator does so um, correctly. Oh, this is old. That was my notes that I was supposed to get rid of. Okay, so finally, Let's talk about um, a discussion about inference. So we have all of, I'm gonna keep you for like four minutes afterwards to talk about inference. All I'm really gonna kind of do is tell you, this is what you should do. And if you disagree, then here are the papers you should go read. Um, in part, this is kind of really, this is even more nascent of a field than the staggered timing papers I was telling you about. Um, the one fact that you have to know when you're doing panel data and difference and difference is you have to cluster on the unit of policy implementation if possible. So there's a very famous paper by um, Marianne Bertrand, Esther Duflo, and Senna Mullenathan from 2004 in the QJE, which is basically pointing out there were a lot of papers prior to this paper that were doing difference and difference or something with panel where they were just doing robust standard errors, for example. And the problem in these settings is that if you do a diff and diff, for example, is that there's a huge amount of serial correlation that exists, say, within individual or within a state, if the policy changes within state. And if you don't cluster on the unit where the policy is changing, you're going to think you have way more significance than you do actually. Like I've actually done this by accident. Like you're running a panel regression, you do it and you forgot to you forget to cluster and you just do robust. You're like, wow, my policy is so significant. And you're totally wrong because there's all this zero correlation. Um, and so that's just kind of the first order thing is, is that just if the policy implementation variation is implemented at the industry level, you should not cluster at the firm level. You should cluster at the industry level. Same story. If it's implemented at the firm level, you shouldn't be using robust standard errors. Um, I say if possible, because clearly in the Cardin-Kruger, 
that's not feasible, right? So Carton Kruger is only these two states. That's what it's being assigned at. Um, that's this small clusters problem. There's really no solution in the Carton Kruger case. And that's part of why I was saying that it's effectively like a case study. But there are approaches for dealing with this with a small number of clusters. Say you only have 10 states or 10 groups, or you only have a couple of things that are treated. Um, typically, these approaches involve bootstrapping and can handle really these small numbers of groups uh, relative to the overall popu population. I kind of really didn't dig into this literature too much. I this is kind of a field I think that needs further work. Um, one person who's been doing a lot of work on this at Michigan is Andreas um, Hagman has a lot of papers on this that I think if you, this is a setting that you're in, this is kind of the place to go look where you're thinking about, I have really small number of groups and I wanna be able to do inference correctly, what can I do? Um, one thing about these, so when thinking about those event study graphs, when considering those, the pre-trend graphs, it's really kind of valuable to use uniform confidence intervals rather than a point-wise confidence intervals. So when you, um, when you do um, those graphs and you do coefficients, right? So say we do those um, event study figures and we get those point-wise, we get those coefficients and we're going to get 95% confidence intervals. Those are what are called point-wise confidence intervals in the sense that those are testing whether or not that one is different. And what um, for Aldenhoven and co-authors advocate for basically using this Olia and Pla uh, Plagborg molar paper is that you should be using these uniform um, soup T confidence bands. So they say applied papers commonly include point-wise confidence intervals and event plots. These permit testing only pre-selected point-wise hypotheses. Uniform bands, such as we show here, are designed to contain the true path of coefficients 95% of the time, and therefore arguably more useful for giving readers a sense of what kind of pre-trends are consistent with the data. So just to give you a sense of like, what does this look like? You know, this is how I've done it. You can just get, you just get these little spikes on the end. Frankly, so this code, Ryan Kessler has this state of code here, um, which just does the, does the inflation for you. I'm going to tell you a secret about this. Literally, it takes your T statistics and it multiplies them by a factor and makes them bigger. So, you know, you have more uncertainty for this, but it's it's inflating them all by the same amount for this uniformity. So this is not like it sound. It's a pretty straightforward thing to kind of do something that's a, probably more plausible and more credible. This is a pretty easy fix. And really what it's doing is it's sort of adding in more uncertainty in this particular setting. Okay, let me conclude. I'm sorry, I kept you a couple minutes late. Basically difference and difference is, is really powerful in applied settings. It doesn't require a random assignment, but the implementation of policies that differentially impact different groups and not confounded by other shocks at the same time, I think is really useful, especially when we have all this data now that you can kind of plot things in a convincing way. It has this nice partial test of identifying assumptions. I think it's really something that you need to be transparent about what's going on. And this is something we're working on. And I think it's really important to note that this is always identifies a relative effect. Um, and to aggregate, you typically need a model and additional strong assumptions. So I have a paper um, with Adrian O'Claire and Will Doby thinking about this in a macro setting. You know, if you want to talk about aggregate macro impacts of something in diff and diff, that requires a lot more assumptions and some other papers about this as well that we talked about. My takeaways from this new literature, and I didn't really get to touch on some of the design-based stuff that I really wanted to, basically beware these weak tests of pre-trends, consider using you know, RNR's partial identification test to assess the robustness of this, but that's pretty new. I think the biggest thing is really like, be aware that you're doing this selection, if you, especially if you're playing around with your pre-trends a lot and you don't have a lot of power. Don't worry about this new literature on staggered timings if you only have one timing. Uh, hopefully that makes everyone feel better if they, they're like, oh, I have to worry about it. No, if you have one timing, don't worry about it. If you are doing staggered timing, think carefully, what's the estimate that you want? You know, software exists for many of these papers. This is really doable. You can do this for yourself. And my, I'm advocating sort of, you know, when you do these uniform um, confidence intervals, when you do confidence intervals in these event studies, you should plot the uniform um, confidence intervals. And that 